Hello my friends and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 Full Honor Mode Party Build Guide. I hope you're all doing well. Today we are going to be taking four different builds, all of which are extremely powerful characters in their own right and putting them together into an extremely powerful and synergistic whole to give you a full party to beat honor mode with. My last full party build guide went over very well and I really appreciate everyone's responses to that and so I'm excited to bring you more of these full build guides going over different themed parties and covering different aspects of the game. For today's party, we are going to be focusing on one of the most powerful things that you can possibly do, the wet condition. This party is centered all around getting your enemies wet, which I'm sure is a phrase we can all be very mature about in the comments. Wet is so powerful, and it's a house rule uh, that exists only in Baldur's Gate 3, not in base Dungeons & Dragons, which gives you some idea of why it's so powerful. Um, because it allows any enemy who is has been exposed to water, has uh, in any way, to take double damage from lightning and frost spells, or any source of lightning or cold damage. And damage vulnerabilities like that are something that Dungeons & Dragons is normally extremely stingy with, because doubling your damage totally breaks the health scaling of the game. This party centers around easily applying, using, and abusing that condition to do some of the most, the highest possible burst damage available in Baldur's Gate 3, one-shotting most enemies in the game. In fact, we will be absolutely guaranteed, or I guess we'll have a, under most circumstances, a 1 in 400 chance of failing to one-shot almost every enemy in the entire game in a single attack, and we're going to add in some of the most powerful sustained damage to finish off any remaining enemies um, in various encounters, or if you just don't feel like burning resources, we'll have extremely powerful resource-free damage, as well as some of the best controlling effects in the game, all centered around using the and applying the wet condition, ice spells, and lightning spells. To do this, we are building four different builds, all of which I've done full build guides for, so if you want these builds in more detail, then you can definitely go check out those videos, and I'll link them in the descriptions, but I'll be going over each of these builds in turn, how they fit together, and how they work in a party. Like all of my full party builds, this is going to be centered around characters that are very powerful individually, that work extremely well together, so they have extreme synergy, and don't interfere with one another. None of these characters will uh, require the same items, uh, none of these characters will require conflicting story choices, and in fact a design goal for me in these party builds is always to never require specific story choices at all, so you're never going to need to make a specific story choice to make this party function, and we also actually only need two specific items over all four builds in order to make this uh, full party work, so your item requirements are very light, you don't need specific story choices or specific illithid powers or anything like that, so you're free to play the honor mode run as you intended to play and have fun with the game. I think a lot of builds for honor mode get stuck in like you have to make this specific story choice or whatever, but it's still a game. We still want to have fun with it. So the goal here is to allow this party to be as flexible as possible while being as powerful as possible to get you through honor mode. All right, let's go over each build one by one and I will tell you how to put together the ultimate lightning party. Quickly before I jump in though, I do want to take a moment to say thank you so much to Recrit for the 10 euro donation, XXZebraXX69 for the $2 donation, and to Morton E. Hagen, Crater, Tombstone Tunes, Angel, and Bojankis for becoming channel members. Thank you so much, my friends. I really do appreciate the support. It really does mean a lot. And uh, once again, thank you so much. If I missaid any of your names, definitely let me know in the comments. All right, let's get into the builds. Our first build is going to be the core of the party and what this party's strategy is centered around, and this character is going to start off most combats by deleting the single most powerful enemy in the encounter, or by blowing up nearly every enemy in the encounter, depending on what spell slots you have available and how many resources you want to spend. This character does guaranteed damage. Um, to bosses, and that guarantee amount of guaranteed damage is fixed. It's not an average, it's an exact number, and that exact number in the late game is going to be 300, or even slightly more than that, which is enough to one-shot nearly every enemy in the entire game, even on honor mode. That means that you're starting most fights with the most powerful enemy on the field gone, and also, depending on how enemies are positioned, you could 
use AOE damage to clear almost every enemy in the in the encounter with this character, leaving the rest of your party to play cleanup. The rest of your party is phenomenally good at playing cleanup, and for fights where this character doesn't want to spend resources or is otherwise uh, unable to contribute, say because an enemy has an immunity to lightning, uh, this character also plays a really good support character, enabling the rest of your party members to obliterate the enemies in its place. Together, that means that between the sustained damage of your other party members and the burst damage of this character, you are going to have uh, both incredible upfront burst and incredible sustain damage if the fight goes long. This character also provides great control and utility, uh, meaning that it's the perfect character to center our party around. This character you can find a full build guide to under the one-shot Lightning Lord, because this character is going to be zapping enemies and blowing them up instantly. Um, and it is also the most complicated of the four builds, so if you're a little put off by the complexity of building this character, don't worry, the others are simpler, and if you just follow the steps that I give here, you will be absolutely fine. The leveling order for this character does matter, and so you do want to follow the order given in this video. Um, I always, whenever I, I talk about this build, get people who want to remove levels or change the levels around or something, and I guarantee you whatever variation you are planning, I have thought of it, and this one is better. Um, obviously, you can still make changes, but this is the best way to construct this character. All right, let's get in and start building the one-shot Lightning Lord. So first up, we are going to start with Sorcerer. This gives us constitution save proficiency, which is awesome for a caster, um, and also allows this to act as our party face, filling one of the roles that we need. You may want to play this character as a standard sorcerer up until level 3, because we're going to be using some specific items for stats, and then we're going to be using one respec later on, which I'll talk about when we get there. So first up, we are going to be taking a, a stat split that is somewhat unusual for Sorcerer, because we only need 14 Charisma, and that is really just for dialogue skills, so if you don't value dialogue skills, you can even drop this down to 8. Uh, and we are going to take 12 Wisdom, 8 Intelligence, 16 Dex, and 16 Con. We will later respec to gain more intelligence, because this character is going to be using its intelligence to do its attacks later on, since we're going to be using levels of wizard to gain access to every spell in the game. However, at these early levels, we don't need the intelligence, because we wouldn't be able to get more than 16 anyways, and uh, we don't have a wizard level at level 1 regardless. So from levels 1 to 3, you are going to play this character using just Magic Missile and Shield from your Sorcerer levels, or you can play a standard Sorcerer up to level 3 and then respec into this build at level 3. Um, and then at level 4, around level 4, you should get access to the Warped Headband of Intellect, allowing you to set your intelligence to 16, or 17, but six, it's the same as 16, and start using your wizard spells offensively. And then sometime around level 6 or 7, you're going to get access to the Gloves of Dexterity, which will let you move your dexterity, your points from dexterity into intelligence, so we can reach maximum intelligence by the end game. So this is going to be our starting stat split, but once we hit once we get access to the Gloves of Dexterity, we are going to respec to place our stats like this so that we can max out intelligence by the end game um, without losing anything else. So just to reiterate, because that's a little bit complicated, levels 1 to 3, you... Uh, don't use your wizard spells offensively because you don't have the headband. Once you get access to the headband, you put that on and start using offensive wizard spells. Once you get access to the gloves of dexterity, you respec to remove your dexterity and wear the gloves instead so that we can max out our wisdom by the end game. For our skill selection, this is our party face, so you're going to take whatever... Uh, whatever dialogue skills you want to have access to, and of course, if you're using Gale for this, then you get Arcana and History for free, and you'll have good ones of those, because you'll have reasonably solid intelligence, at least by the mid-game. Um, and then you can take, like, Persuasion and Deception, so that you can still make dialogue checks. Again, if you don't care about dialogue checks, you can skip the Gloves of Dexterity thing, and just build this as a normal uh, wizard stat spread with 16, with uh, 14 Dex instead of 14 Charisma, but we don't get dialogue skills anywhere else in this party, and this is the character that it's most convenient to use them on, so if you do want dialogue skills, this is the way to grab them. For our uh, 
class selection here, we are going to take Storm Sorcerer. Level 1 of Storm Sorcerer lets us fly as a bonus action every time we cast a spell, which is incredibly powerful. And then later on, we're going to use the Storm Sorcery powers to gain uh, additional lightning damage and additional effects from lightning spells whenever we cast them. For our spell selection with Sorcerer, we are going to be avoiding things that have save DCs because we have low charisma. We will be taking our combat spells from Wizard instead because we're going to have high um, intelligence. And so we can focus on taking utility spells with our Sorcerer levels. This lets us grab Minor Illusion with this character, Mage Hand with this character, Friends, which, helps us, which enables us to do uh, more in the way of party face stuff because you can use friends and then leave the area and still so even though our dialogue skills won't be as high as say a bard or a monoclass uh, warlock or sorcerer you get friends and you can use that to make that up and then we'll take true strike just to annoy youtube commenters this character actually does have some more uses for true strike than uh you might think though because getting advantage on attacks is actually really good for this character so there are actually cases for this a character where you might want to cast True Strike if there's nowhere on the field that you can hide. It's very, very rare, don't get me wrong, but it is possible. Um, and then for our utility spells, we are just going to take uh, Shield and Magic Missile. We are looking for utility spells from Sorcerer. These are two of the best and will enable us to play in the early game. That's level one. Let's go on to level two. Level 2, we are going to branch out and put a level into Cleric. We're going to take Tempest Cleric, because we are going to be wanting to maximize our damage as a Cleric, um, using the level 2 Tempest Domain ability, and that will allow us to maximize Lightning Damage, which we're going to be doubling with the Wet Condition. Taking one level of Cleric also gives us a bunch of other cool stuff. We get three cantrips, and that cantrip can include Thaumaturgy, giving us access to better dialogue skills. We also get Blade Ward, which we didn't take from our Sorcerer levels, and we get Guidance, so that we have multiple sources of Guidance on the, on that in this party always want multiple sources of guidance so that characters can use multiple reactions and this will make us even better at passing dialogue checks. For our prepared spells, uh, most of the time, also notice that we get Fog Cloud, which is just a very useful spell to have access to. Um, and for our prepared spells, most of the time, we are going to want to have Create Water, which later on we're going to be able to quicken, and Healing Word, which is just a very powerful utility spell. Another great spell to have access to is Sanctuary. This character will not want to be concentrating on Bless, but will get Bless from a different character anyways. So those are our, our options overall. At level 3, we are going to multi-class a third time and take Wizard. This allows us to learn Wizard spells from a scroll up from scrolls up to our total caster level. And because we took Wizard third items and uh, as as our third first level, thanks to a quirk of how Baldur's Gate calculates save DCs from items and scrolls, items and scrolls will now use our intelligence to cast. This is very important for this character because we're going to be using Mark Heshkir most likely and uh, having this character cast scrolls and stuff, and it's a sorcerer primarily, so you'll have the ability to quicken and twin casting from scrolls, making this one of the best scroll users in the game. So it's very important that we take our levels in this order so that we get access to all of the uh, get access to con save proficiency and dialogue skills from Sorcerer while still getting access to intelligence-based attack uh, save DCs from items from taking Wizard at level 3. For our cantrip selection from Wizard, now we can take combat cantrips like Ray of Frost, which is obviously insane in a party that's centering around... Um, the wet condition and bone chill. You get to take both of these and have both the best utility damage cantrips in the game. Uh, this party will have other ways to set fires, so we won't need fire bolt. So you can just grab something else. If you're a big shocking grasp fan, you can take shocking grasp. I wouldn't recommend casting it that often, but it does have some uses, and this is a lightning focused party, so we can just grab all three of those or take other utility spells. Uh, we are going to want absolutely to make sure that we learn Chromatic Orb and Witch Bolt at level 1. Uh, this character already knows Witch Bolt from a scroll, so it's not showing up here, but um, 
let me just show you that. So we have Witch Bolt, and we will want Chromatic Orb. We also just want all of the other good wizard spells. This character can be your Long Strider user and can have Enhanced Jump as a ritual. We already have Shield from our Sorcerer levels, so we're going to grab just spells that have save DCs from our wizard spells. We can take stuff like Ice Knife and Grease to knock enemies over. Uh, and you can take Find Familiar, very useful in the early game, or Disguise Self, uh, because this is your dialogue caster. For your prepared spells, you are going to take Chromatic Orb, which can be used to deal lightning damage, or cold damage, which you can then double, and uh, Witch Bolt, which is going to be our best single target damage spell in the late game, because it can critically hit and instantly delete enemies. Forgive the, the known spells already, Gal just already knows some spells in this save, so you just need to um, ignore the ones that we already know. At level 4, we're going back to Cleric, because this gets us the uh, Destructive Wrath uh, Channel Divinity ability. So once per short rest, or more often if we have ability items that increase our number of Channel Divinities, we can choose to maximize our Lightning Damage with a level 6 cast of Witch Bolt, which does 6d12 of Lightning Damage. That's 72 damage when maximized. When doubled by the Wet Condition, that's 144 damage. And when doubled again, if we can get a critical hit, that's 288 damage. We then add a bunch of damage uh, in addition to that from our items and class features. So we're doing 300 plus damage with a single attack in the late game, if we can guarantee a critical hit in some way. And you can do that using the uh, Luck of the Far Realm's Illithid Power, the Killer's Sweetheart Ring, and there's a few other ways, or just by attacking with advantage and wearing critical hit gear. That's the source of this character's massive damage output and why it is so powerful. Next, we are... Uh, you can either go to back to Sorcerer to get access to Twin Spell, which will let you twin your... Um, which will let you twin your Witch Bolts, but we won't have enough Sorcerer levels to have the Sorcery Points to twin a third level spell yet. So at this level, I actually like going back one level for Wizard and taking Divination Wizard. This gives you an yet another powerful feature of this character, because you get Portents, which will also, if you roll a 20 on your Portent, let you guarantee a critical hit, but also just guaranteeing any hit with your very powerful attack roll spells is incredibly strong on this character, and will let you be certain to instantly delete enemies. So you can just pick up Divination Wizard at this level. You could also take more Sorcerer levels if you want access to the meta magic earlier. Either way is good. What spells you take at this level is, is pretty irrelevant because you're mostly at, by level 5 using spells that you've learned from scrolls as a wizard. Then we're going to finish off by taking Sorcerer levels for the rest of the game. This gets us access to meta magic and um, more powerful utility spells. So we can take spells that we might want as out of combat utility. So everything from Sorcerer is just out of combat utility. Stuff like Feather Fall or Expeditious Retreat or Disguise Self are all useful to have from our Sorcerer levels. And we get access to Twinned and Distant Spell so that we can... Uh, fire our shots further, and also f hit two enemies at once with them. And then at the next level, we get access to Quicken Spell, letting us do it twice in a single turn. This lets us cast, for example, um, Quickened Witch Bolt and Quickened, uh, uh, qu Quickened Lightning Bolt followed by a Witch Bolt, for example, or Chain Lightning followed by another Chain Lightning, if that's something that we want to do in the late game, and is absurdly powerful. This character's action economy is second to none. Between Quickening spells and twinning, um, twinning our spells, we're going to be firing off at least three spells in rounds where we want to burn sorcery points for incredible amounts of damage. This also gives us access to one of the most powerful strategies in the game, Twinned Haste, and because we have Cleric levels, we can prepare Sanctuary as well. So we can Sanctuary ourselves and Twin Haste um, on multiple allies and for fights where we don't want to use the powerful Lightning Blast. Um, our other spell selection here, again, we're just looking for spells that don't have save DCs because we're getting ones with save DCs from our wizard uh, spell selection, so we can take stuff like Cloud of Daggers, Enhance Ability, anything that we think we might want um, throughout the game. Misty Step is probably the most useful. Now, by this point, you should definitely have the Gloves of Dexterity and have 
respec to this stat split uh, by the time you hit level 8, and so we are just going to be boosting our intelligence. You could also, at this point, if you are finding that you're not having trouble landing your shots, just take alert. Alert is really, really powerful, and obviously being able to delete an enemy immediately is incredibly strong, but um, this character is slightly more late game focused anyways, and we should have the gloves of dexterity for decent initiative rolls. So I like to focus on just boosting our, maxing out our intelligence. This character also can benefit from Ethel's hair. So if you're doing that, you could take 10 wisdom, 17 intelligence, and then get alert and maxed intelligence without sacrificing anything. Cantrip selection at this point doesn't matter. Spell selection, again, we're just looking for utility spells. Cloud of Daggers is always good to have. But anything without a save or attack roll. Next, at level 5, you are taking um, Counterspell, because you cannot get Counterspell from a scroll. There's no scroll of Counterspell. You need to actually learn it as a sorcerer, and this character is our Counterspell user, so that it's really powerful to get Counterspell. Uh, one of the best defensive reactions in the game, and you always want it prepared, so you should take it on your sorcerer levels. Then we get access to Heart of the Storm and uh, Resistance to Lightning and Thunder, both of which are pretty useful. We also get Sleet Storm always prepared. The save DC on the Sleet Storm won't be good because um, the, the save DC on, on Sleet Storm won't be good because this is from your Sorcerer levels. But the ability to create a giant ice surface is nice and it prevents us from having to prepare it on our wizard. Of course, our other characters are all going to get access to <laughs> Sleet Storm or we'll have access to Sleet Storm from two other characters. So we don't need it on this character. Always want haste on this character, so you can twin haste. We probably have it from a scroll, but if we don't, we can pick it up from our sorcerer level. And again, we're just looking for spells that are utility that we haven't learned from scrolls. And then finally, we are going to max out our intelligence, hitting 20 intelligence. If you used Ethel's hair, you can hit 20 intelligence and alert, guaranteeing that you hit... Um, that you are able to maximize your damage output. One thing that we don't need for this character is Elemental Adept. Um, it, the damage is so high that you will often just ignore, you'll be able to blast enemies through resistance anyways. Um, and you will usually have advantage on your attacks, so we don't really need the, the reroll. Although Halfling is one of the best characters for this uh, best races for this character as well because rerolling concentration checks is really good and rerolling misses is really good if you happen to roll a one. Um, but because this character has so many control and utility options just from being a full, wiz uh, fully powered wizard, you don't need to be able to burst things with your lightning damage in every encounter. So we don't need to take elemental adept. You can if you want to, but it's not required. And then again, we're just taking utility spells, whatever we think we might need. When you put it all together, this character is capable of just one-shotting enemies by maximizing your attacks with Witch Bolt um, and then twinning them. You can quicken Create Water to get an enemy wet first, although other characters will probably be able to more easily apply the wet condition. And in fights where uh, just blasting an enemy for 300 damage isn't enough, you will be able to twin cast haste. To power up this character with items, you are going to want to be using Markahesh gear, set it to lightning damage, and that increases your lightning damage and gives you multiple casts of chain lightning every single day, which is super powerful. Uh, you want the warped headband of intellect for the early game and the gloves of dexterity. And then some important scrolls. You always want gro globe of invulnerability in a party, so this character uses that as well and uh, chain lightning is very important to know because that's going to be your late damage late game aoe damage spell also just lightning bolt uh, is a really useful spell to learn as well so you definitely want to pick that up but witch bolt and chromatic orb twinned between the two of them are going to do most of your damage finally the killer's sweetheart ring is one way to guarantee critical hits and guaranteed critical hits are good and other critical hit gear is pretty good on this character as well also just anything that increases your attack rolls with spells is very good 
Overall, this is the most complicated character with the most specific requirements, but it's really worth it because deleting an enemy with 300 damage is so powerful and so good. For a demonstration of that, you can go check out the full build guide video that I did, uh, and then let's get on to the next character. For our second character, we're going with a real classic, the Throne Weapon Barbarian. The Throwing Weapon Berserker is some of the highest sustained damage in the entire game, of course, because we get to break bounded accuracy using Tavern Brawler, so we are doing double our strength on every throw, and every throw is hitting at like 95% because we get to double our strength strength chance to hit, our strength bonus to hit as well. So this character almost always hits, does incredible damage, and has super high um, control because every bonus action throw that we do from Berserker knocks enemies prone without a saving throw. Uh, that's incredibly powerful and will allow us to keep enemies basically always on the ground between the ice surfaces that this party easily puts out and the bonus act the the prone throws from berserker this character is also secretly the best way in the game to apply the wet condition because we get all these thrown weapon attacks which are very accurate and do lots of damage and they don't have to be weapon attacks they can be other things and those things can include bottles or even barrels of water Throwing a bottle of water at someone does quite good damage, knocks them prone because of this character's abilities, and gets them wet, allowing the rest of your party to set up the incredible amounts of damage that you're doing to them and, uh, with your next attacks. It's in incredibly strong and incredibly synergistic, and also applies uh, adds a ton of sustained damage to this build that already has some of the best upfront burst damage in the game. So our party is now capable of excelling in both very short encounters and very long encounters. We're going to start with a level of Rogue, which is great to start with for this character, because we're going to want at least three levels of Rogue for Thief Rogue down the line. And so this gets us great skill access and lets this character be our lockpicking character, our stealth character, and just have ex access to excellent skills uh, throughout the game. The d downside of starting with Rogue is you only get light armor, but this character will have great AC even naked, uh, because you have the Barbarian's unarmored defense and can get like mage armor and... and, and can get uh, bonuses from that won't stack with mage armor but you can get ac bonuses from shields items and so on uh, to have great ac unarmored or use some of the powerful light armors in the game which won't be in demand by the rest of your party so this will let you use like the elven chain or the cat's grace cloth uh to use an item set that is otherwise unused by the rest of your party so it's not that real not that big a problem that we don't get medium armor proficiency for our ability selection, there are two different ways that we could build this character. You can either take 8 strength and drink an elixir of strength every single day, and that will allow you to have much higher other stats, or we can just build a high strength natively. If you're doing the elixir build, you get one more feat, which is pretty nice, and you get to take higher other stats, but if you do have to drink the strength elixir once per day, no other characters in the party need those, so it's not a huge imposition, but definitely a downside, and of course you can free up your elixir slot for a bloodlust elixir or a resistance elixir if you don't do that. I'm going to build as though we are not using the elixir build, but I will mention where it deviates if we are using elixirs every day. So if you're not using, if you are using elixirs, you're going to want to start with um, 16 dexterity, 17 constitution, and 14 wisdom. Uh, and then you can put your remaining two points kind of wherever. It doesn't really matter where you put the last two points, honestly, so we can put those in intelligence. Um, and if you are not using elixirs, then you are going to want to take... 17 Strength, 14 Dexterity, and 10 Wisdom, as well as 16 Constitution. So this is going to be our stat split for the non-Elixir build, but I showed you the stat split for the Elixir build as well. For our skill selection here, we get to have Expertise and Sleight of Hand, so this character is going to be excellent at opening locks for us. And for our second Expertise, I like putting it in Athletics. This character will be very easily able to push and manipulate enemies, and that's something that's very powerful when we're laying down as many uh, surface effects as this party will be doing. We don't need Acrobatics if we have Athletics. They're completely redundant, so you can just put your remaining points elsewhere. You get Perception, because you're a Barbarian, and you can put your last point in, I don't know, Investigation. Level 2, we get to take Barbarian, 
um, giving us access to rage, and so we can do more damage with this character. And then at level 3 we get Reckless Attack. It's important to know that Reckless Attack does work on thrown weapons, but you can't use it on the actual throw. You have to use it as a melee attack manually, and then the remaining, any throws that you do for the rest of the turn will have advantage from Reckless Attack. So if you need advantage on subsequent throws, you can Reckless Attack once, and then attack with advantage three times for your four attacks that turn, uh, which is often more efficient than making just four attacks. Barbarian level 3, we get to take Berserker Barbarian, giving us access to Enraged Throw, which is the whole thing that makes this work. When we are in a rage, we get a bonus action throw. So at this level, we've got uh, two attacks per round, which is already very powerful. And then at later levels, it just gets better and better. At Barbarian level 4, we get to take Tavern Brawler. Tavern Brawler is incredibly broken, and because it doubles your strength bonus to throws, meaning that we completely break bounded accuracy and will always hit with our attacks, and also do incredibly high damage. We're doing triple our strength damage with the bonus action attacks and double with every other attack, so every point of strength we get is super valuable. Um, if you're the Elixir build here, of course, you'll just t take a point in Constitution with your Tavern Brawler point instead. Then we get Barbarian level 5, which gives us extra attacks, so now we're making 3 attacks in a round uh, per turn, with no haste or anything like that, meaning that we are outputting incredible damage. And then we go back into Rogue, getting us Cunning Action, Hide, and Dash. Both of these are actually quite useful for this character, because positioning is very important. While this is a ranged character, so you don't need to be... At getting into melee with enemies, you can position this character exactly where you want it on the field, and this character is very resilient thanks to being a barbarian, uh, so sometimes it's good to, like, reckless attack and then position in uh, the middle of the enemies to draw attacks if, for whatever reason, you haven't killed everything by the time this character's turn comes around. And then at Rogue level 3, we get to take Thief Rogue, giving us a second bonus action. This allows us to enter Rage and then attack with a bonus action throw in the same turn, and then in subsequent turns of combat, we get to just throw twice. So your opening round of combat, you get three attacks, and every subsequent turn of combat, you get four attacks, giving you some of the most uh, powerful sustained damage output in the game. All those attacks get all the benefits of Tavern Brawler, which is incredibly strong, and so you're doing massive damage, or just punching enemies around the field, hip bopping them over the head with water bottles, setting them up for your allies to zap them with lightning and cold spells. Next, there's a couple ways to finish off this build. You can either go into Fighter, or you can max out Barbarian. I like... Uh, leveling up in Barbarian, because that's going to get us Feral Instinct, so that will let us basically get a pseudo-alert at level 7 Barbarian without having to spend a feat on it, which is really powerful. Fighter obviously gives you Action Surge for more upfront burst damage, but this party honestly doesn't need upfront burst damage. Um, we really just want to be winning initiative with this character, so we can set up our other characters for upfront burst damage. So I think that the best way to level up is to take another level of Rogue to get your 20 strength, and then just to finish out with Barbarian. Though, it is an option to go four levels of Fighter if you want to get... Um, action surge in this build. I don't think we need it, and I think that uh, Feral Instinct is actually better for us here. We also get Mindless Rage, which is really good, because we, uh, especially for the non-Elixir build, because we have 10 Wisdom, so this makes us immune to most effects that target Wisdom while we're in our Frenzied Rage, meaning that we can pretty safely ignore a lot of the effects that uh, would normally hit our relatively low wisdom saves and make those a problem. This character will no longer have problems with uh, bad wisdom saves. And then we get Feral Instinct at Barbarian level 7, giving us plus 3 to initiative and can't be surprised. In combination with 14 Dexterity, that gives us a pretty respectable plus 5 to initiative. Not the highest initiative in the entire world, but pretty good. Um, and so we'll be winning initiative relatively regularly, and you can boost that with other initiative gear. Initiative, of course, is incredibly important for Honor Mode, so uh, you definitely want to be boosting that 
wherever possible, and it's very good to get alert on as many characters as you can as a result. And then finally we get Barbarian level 8, where we can take alert here and boost our initiative even further, and then we will be winning every single initiative roll with this character, which lets us enter rage so that we are no longer vulnerable to uh, mindless spells, or to, to spells that target wisdom, to most spells that target wisdom, and with our now plus 10 to initiative, we're going to win basically every initiative roll and can set up the wet condition for our party before the rest of the party goes, um, or at least at the same time as the rest of the party goes, meaning that we are almost always winning uh, we get to knock enemies prone and get them wet before they get a turn. Again, be cool in the comments, everyone. Um, so that we can set up the party for maximum damage. For itemization for this character, honestly, there's not much if you're that you we particularly need. The Ring of Flinging is good, and any... Dam any item that increases our damage dice, just uh, anything that has um, damage dice on hit, like, uh, let me find one here. I didn't didn't prepare this, but like the Dark Justicia gauntlets that do additional damage with your weapon attacks. Stuff like that is very good for this character. Just any damage boosts you can get are really powerful, um, as well as just boosts your AC and saving throws are really good for this character as well. Uh, you'll want a good shield and a good set of light armor, or if you are using, uh, if you're unarmored, if your unarmored AC is higher, d due to having high constitution, you'll just want a decent set of unarmored gear, like the Bone Spike Garb, for example. Other than that, you don't need anything, except, of course, you need a weapon with the returning property so that you can use it for throwing. In the early game, that's going to be the returning pike, and in the late game, it's probably going to be Nyrolna. Nyrolna also allows you to do thunder damage, which is relevant in some ways for this party. Also, if you can find a way to have this character do additional lightning damage, like um, the Drake Throat Glaive setting your weapon to lightning, then that will all be doubled by the wet condition and let you electrify water surfaces and stuff as well, which is very powerful. So overall, no specific item requirements for this character except for a returning weapon, um, just anything with the returning property, and uh, other than that, you're good to go. For character number three, we get to have a really fun class because this is a monoclassed character. Um, you might be surprised to see those showing up in optimized honor mode parties, but there are very strong monoclasses, and this is one of them. We've already taken care of upfront burst damage with our Lightning Lord build and sustained damage with our Barbarian Thrower, so now we're going to add in a bunch of control, utility, and support in the form of a Tempest Cleric. Tempest Cleric, of course, also is one of the best classes in the game at applying and and abusing the wet condition and is just an extremely powerful option, giving you access to some of the most broken features in the game. In particular, the buff on heal items are really good to have access to in every party. As well, you get access to radiant orb stacking, one of the most broken mechanics in the game. And in the late game, you get access to reverberation stacking as well. This character is going to be not only doing incredible damage thanks to the combination of the lightning uh, damage that Tempest Cleric he gets naturally and the wet condition that we're applying with our entire party, but also gets access to some of the best control effects in the game and uh, is going to be uniquely suited to using them. In the late game, we're going to be ping-ponging enemies all over the field as they run across electrified water surfaces and they get knocked sideways by our Tempest Cleric class features, as well as being able to instantly stack up Radiant Orbs with... Um, with Spirit Guardians and with Destructive Wrath, we can use Radiant Orbs and Reverberation, which are two of the more powerful things that you can be doing in the game in general. We're going to be taking uh, Tempest Cleric, of course, because that's the lightning-focused cleric, and that's what we want, and this also gives us access to some of the best spells in the game as we level up, and we're going to be taking a very... Uh, fun stat split where we get to have some of the highest stats available in the entire game by taking 17 Wisdom, 
16 constitution to maintain our saving throws, and 15 dexterity. We don't really need any other stats on this character, so we get to take uh, the the greediest possible stat split. Whenever I take this stat split, also I do get the question of why put in the odd numbers. The answer is this is, as you can see, the highest three stats we could take in the game. If we could take three 16s, we would, but since we can't, this is how you get 16, or 18, 16, 16 by using only a single level up. Just have, wanna answer that question because I always get it. For our cantrip selection here, we are going to have our second copy of Guidance. We also get to have Blade Ward. And our combat spell on this character is going to be Produce Flame. Uh, now, this does have some anti-synergy with the wet condition, but is still very useful in the early game before we really have the lightning stuff online. Also, being able to set things on fire is just really good. Although, if you're using Shadow Hearts, you can do that naturally. But if you aren't using Shadow Heart, then uh, Produce Flame is very useful to be able to set things on fire. Sometimes you just need some fire. Our spell selection uh, at this level is, we'll do at next level when it lets us prepare spells. But our spell selection at this level is going to be pretty standard. You always want to have Bless, which we can be concentrating on. You want Command and you want Healing Word. That gives us a bunch of uh, great options. You also want a Damage spell, usually Guiding Bolt. And then later on, we're going to be using Creator Destroy Water as well. Also, it's very important to have Sanctuary um, prepared, so later especially we're going to be using Sanctuary in order to make sure that we have access to that at all times. Between this and the Wizard, we have two copies of Sanctuary, which is great. That's something I like to have in all my Honor Mode builds, so you can save an ally who's gotten out of position. Cleric level 3, we get access to level 2 spells, including some of the most powerful spells in the game. Um, we are going to be making sure that we take Spiritual Weapon. It's a great bonus action spell and gives us uh, a, an extra summon. This build will be able to use a lot of summons. Later on, we'll want to prepare Aid and cast it because it is very good. Um, but at this level, I wouldn't recommend spending your spell slots on it. Pardon me, I was ambushed by a terrible sneeze, so I had to pause the video for a second there uh, to spare headphone users. Um, but we are back! So we're taking uh, Spiritual Weapon because you can use it to block up choke points. Also, it doesn't get knocked over by ice surfaces, so you can hit enemies who are being knocked prone by the ice surfaces and everything else that your party is putting out. Cleric level 4, we are going to even out our ability scores, hitting 18 Wisdom and 16 Dexterity, and we get plus 3 initiative already on this character, which is really nice for a Cleric. You do get heavy armor access, but you can also use the medium armors that are uncapped for Dexterity, and in the early game, the 16 Dexterity will be better, plus a medium armor will be better than most heavy armors you have available, so it's worth keeping that in mind and swapping between medium and heavy armors as appropriate. I'm going to grab uh, Resistance here. You're going to want a copy of Resistance for some saving throws that you have to make for story events later on, so we can get that at level 4. There shouldn't be any that you need it for earlier than that. For our level 3 spells, we are going to make sure that we have Glyph of Warding. This lets us set up... Uh, AoE cold or lightning damage, all of which is doubled by the wet condition. We're going to pick up mass healing word so we can easily apply the buff on heal items. And then we are going to pick up spiritual spirit guardians, which is going to do incredible amounts of damage and let us stack up radiant, radiating orbs. This character, unlike most clerics, because we do get um, call lightning and sleep storm, the... Spirit Guardians isn't the only thing that we're going to be concentrating on. We have other great level 3 options for if we need control or if we just need lightning damage. And remember, we can maximize this. We can double it. Um, but Spirit Guardians is still just very good. Radiant Orb stacking is super powerful, so it's great to have that option. Character level 6, we get Thunderbolt Strike, which is way better than it sounds. Um, whenever you deal lightning or thunder damage to a creature that's large or smaller, you can push it up to 10 feet. Well, importantly, if you electrify a water surface that's on the ground, you count as dealing that damage. So enemies running across electrified water surfaces, you get to hit them with Thunderbolt Strike uh, and just ping pong them all over the arena. This means that you can use even a melted Sleet Storm, or if you stop concentrating on Sleet Storm, it just turns into water, to electrify it and 
spray enemies all over the field in various directions. It's incredibly strong and also extremely fun, and I highly recommend doing it. That does mean that in general, on your turns, you're going to want to try to electrify water surfaces with this character, so you're going to want to use this character's uh, lightning damage before you use another character's lightning damage, just to make sure that it's this character that applies the lightning damage to the water surface, so you get maximum value out of Thunderbolt Strike starting at level 6. Cleric level 7 gets us access to Freedom of Movement from the Tempest Domain, which is actually a really nice one to have in our back pocket, as well as Ice Storm to both do great damage and set up an enormous ice surface, which is an incredibly powerful effect. We can also prepare some additional spells. Um, Guardian of Faith is really good. Banishment is really nice to have access to as well because it is it targets charisma and there are some bosses that have extremely low charisma saves so having banishment somewhere in the party is really good to have um, in addition and then at cleric level eight we get divine strike not a huge bonus because this is just for melee attacks and we aren't making melee attacks i should also mention that in the early game you are possibly going to want to be using uh, just a bow on this character. As a Tempest Cleric, you get mar all martial weapons, so you can use a heavy crossbow or a longbow uh, just fine, regardless of what race you pick. Um, and with 14 dexterity, sometimes that'll be better than a Produce Flame, just because it's longer range. So in the very early game, you can use a bow for this character. At this level, rather than max out our Wisdom, I think it's important to get Alert early. This gets us up to plus 8 uh, plus eight to our initiative rolls with no other bonuses, meaning that this character can often go first to apply Create Water, or to lock down enemies with Command or a giant Sleet Storm. It's very important that your controlling characters get to go first, so we want Alert on as many characters as possible as early as possible. Cleric level 9 gets us 5th level spells, of which the prepared spells are not amazing, but we get Destructive Wrath from being a... Tempest Domain Cleric, and because this does both Radiant and Thunder damage and knocks enemies prone, uh, and always works because it's a save for half, you can use this very easily to apply Reverberation stacks and Radiating Orb stacks onto bosses. Both of those are really powerful, so it's very good to be able to do that if you're using the gear sets that allow you to do that. And at Cleric level 10, you get Divine Intervention. Um, again, like with the previous uh, full party guide I did, the Divine Intervention Mace is probably best in slot for this character as, in terms of weapons, just because the healing aura is really good. It just lets you apply the buffs really well. So you can uh, have that equipped. We get another cantrip, just take whatever. And then at Cleric level 11, you get access to a bunch of other, a uh, bunch of great stuff. Most of the time, if you aren't using Hero's Feast from a camp follower, you're going to be using this character's six level slot for Hero's Feast. It's also worth mentioning that any gear that refreshes spell slots should go to the Lightning character because its spell slots just one shot enemies. So you want you want to use that. Um, but getting Hero's Feast on your whole party is just so powerful that it's very much worth doing. If you use a level 6 slot from this character for Hero's Feast and a level 4 slot for Aid, it leaves you your level 5 slots for Destructive Wrath and your level 3 slots for Sleet Storm and um, Glyph of Warding and Spirit Guardians. So those two day-long buffs you can have out on this character, and it'll buff up everything, including the summons that our fourth character is going to be bringing to the table. And then finally, we're going to max out our Wisdom. And this character is just going to be an extremely powerful damage dealer uh, and great at sustained damage thanks to Call Lightning, but also a very powerful controller because you are just a, a monoclass Tempest Cleric. We get Alert on our Tempest Cleric, which is really nice. The one thing that this character doesn't have is amazing concentration uh, saves. So if you really feel like you don't need Alert, you could take Warcaster instead. I personally prefer Alert. Uh, or just a level of Sorcerer as your first level. Um, I personally prefer Alert. I just really highly value winning initiative, and you should too. Uh, but those are some other alternative options. Most of the time, you can just use uh, any gear that boosts concentration saves on this character, or just have them concentrating on stuff you don't care that much if they lose concentration on Call Lightning. And by the time they would lose concentration on Spirit Guardians, the damage is already done most of the time anyways. 
For gear for this character, you're just going to want uh, the best heavy armor available. You're going to want the buff on heal item set, especially for the early game. And uh, you are also going to want so the Hellrider's Pride and the Whispering Promise, which give Bless and Blade Ward to allies you heal, so you can heal them with Mass Healing Word. Any gear that applies Radiating Orbs is also really good, and any gear that applies Reverberation is really good. Best in slot item is the uh, Devotee's Mace, which gives you the healing aura to apply Hellrider's Pride and Whispering Promise buffs. And other than that, um, a piece of gear that gives Misty Step, like the Nightwalkers, is also really important because this character doesn't otherwise get access to Misty Step. Another notable item is the Staff of Arcane Blessing because this gives your Bless an additional 1d4 to... Uh, an additional 1d4. The tooltip is very misleading here. It basically is normal Bless, but you get to roll 2d4 instead of 1d4 on spell attack rolls. Your Lightning Lord build, making Chromatic Orb attacks and Witch Bolt attacks, will be rolling a lot of spell attack rolls, and you want those to land. So especially in the early game, this can be a very powerful way to buff up that character's chances to hit with the Staff of Arcane Blessing, and it, it's worth keeping that in mind as an item for this character as well. Other than that, though, no particular item requirements. We're just looking at stuff that... Um, Increases our save DC is always good, and this is the character that wants the DC gear. This character, the, the Lightning Lord, is going to want to hit gear, and, and the Tempest Cleric is going to want save DC gear, so they're not really competing for the same gear, even though they're both full spellcasters. For our fourth character, honestly, there's a lot of directions that we could go. Um, there are many different characters that we could use that would all fit very well into this party, because we have burst damage covered, we have sustain damage covered, we have control covered, and we have uh, support covered. So we have most of the things that a party needs covered by our build already. So we could go in a lot of different directions. The direction that I'm going to suggest going is a moon druid. There are two main reasons for that. One is that, it, well, three main reasons. One is more control is always good. Druids add a lot of extra control, as well as a whole extra dimension to this party by adding in a bunch of summons. Two is that Moon Druids are secretly one of the other best characters at applying and using the wet condition because their elemental summons and their Myrmidon forms, uh, specifically the ice Myrmidon and ice elemental forms and summons, are incredibly powerful for applying and using um, the wet condition. This lets you add a whole extra set of burst damage, as well as the massive sustained damage just that Moon Druids generally bring to the table to your party, while also providing an incredible amount of control. The third is just that Moon Druids, I think, are one of the best characters for the first three levels. Because the spider form is so powerful early as a wild shape form, Moon Druids are some of the best combatants in the early levels of the game, and we have a couple other builds in this party that take a level or two to come on. Online. The Lightning Lord build really wants to hit level 4 to get its maximized lightning. The Barbarian build really wants to hit level 4 to get its second throw. So having the Moon Druid that can kind of that has incredible damage and incredible utility in the first three levels of the game, I think adds a lot to this party as one of the best the very best early game party uh, members between Torch and Shillelagh for level 1 damage, and the very powerful wild shape forms that you get at low levels, uh, starting at level 2. So that's why I suggest a Moon Druid, but I did want to mention there's a bunch of other directions you could take this party, if there's something else that you're more interested in running. For our cantrip selection here, we are going to take Shillelagh, and we're going to take Guidance, because it's always good to have Guidance. Um, this character will not need Produce Flame, because we already have uh, Produce Flame, but that will be your combat cantrip. Uh, not need Produce Flame at level 1, because for your combat cantrip, you're actually just going to want to use Shillelagh and get in melee most of the time. But uh, you will eventually want uh, Produce Flame. Having a another Guidance is very useful in this party. If you don't feel like you need three Guidances, and you probably don't need three, then you can skip it on this character and take Produce Flame instead. For our ability 
spread for this character. We're going to take a pretty unusual stat spread, one that you won't see me use that often. Not that unusual for a moon druid, but pretty unusual for my build. We are going to be taking 17 in wisdom, and we are going to be taking uh, 16 in dexterity, and then 15 in constitution. It's very rare that you'll see me take 15 constitution, but because this is a druid and is going to spend most of their time in wild shape, where you're using the hit points of the wild shape form, our hit points in humanoid form don't actually matter that often, and our constitution saves, like concentration checks, are going to be rolled using the wild shape form's constitution anyways. So we can get away with the odd number in constitution at these low levels, uh, and it's more important that we win initiative. Having good initiative and ACs in humanoid form is very important, because often we're going to want to start fights by casting one concentration spell and then entering wild shape, so we really want to have high dexterity for the early game. That means that most of our fights are going to start with us uh, casting while casting a, a powerful concentration spell and then entering wild shape immediately and in the early game the 16 dexterity will help us do that before the enemies actually go one quick trick with this character that is worth uh knowing of course for every oh, <laughs> hit the wrong button there one quick tr trick with this character that's worth knowing is that if you have the shillelagh cantrip and you apply it to a torch um a lit torch does 1d4 plus 1d4 burning damage, and so that 1d4 gets turned to 1d8, giving you the highest damage weapon in the game in the early game uh, with a shillelagh torch. That does basically 1d8 plus 1d4 plus your wisdom in damage. So for the first couple levels, that's going to be one of the most powerful things you can possibly be doing is casting shillelagh on a torch and uh, going to town. At level 2, we are going to take Moon Druid, and the reason for this is the bonus action Wild Shapes, and because it gives us access to the Spider Wild Shape, which is incredibly powerful in the early game. Spider Wild Shape traps enemies around and, and poisons them, does a lot of uh, damage. It's really good to be able to do that, and so I highly recommend use, using and abusing Spider Wild Shape. All of the Wild Shape forms have their places, but that's the one that is going to carry your team through the early game most easily. For prepared spells at this list, we already have Longstrider from elsewhere, but we can definitely grab a third copy of Healing Word. Always good to have this on lots of different characters. Um, we can pick up Ice Knife as just a good default combat spell. Create or Destroy Water is, of course, core to this party's concept. And we can use something like... Um, and we, we can use Entangle because that's a great level 1 concentration spell that we can be concentrating on while we go into Wild Shape. And we can use something like Thunder Wave for an emergency. Level 2 is where a lot of the really good stuff comes in for druids. Level 2 spells is where a lot of the really good stuff comes in for druids because we get access to spike growth, one of the best things we could be concentrating on. Flaming Sphere, which while it will melt ice surfaces, is still just a really good summon. Um, you can also use Heat Metal. You can also use Sanctuary plus Moonbeam to cheese certain encounters. This character can't Sanctuary itself, but you can Sanctuary it with another character and then have this character enter a room and Moonbeam encounters safely because the damage doesn't count as coming from the caster. Lots of different options for our spells here, all of which are very good. At level 4, we get to take a feat, and we are just going to even out our ability scores, because it's very important to do that. Get our extra cantrip here, and now we can take Produce Flame for if we want a ranged option. And at level 5, we get access to another set of really powerful concentration spells. Something that is worth keeping in mind is that you can't reactivate Call Lightning while in Wild Shape form, unfortunately. It, it, the game just doesn't let you. So Call Lightning isn't very good, but Sleet Storm is one of the best uh, possible control spells. And Plant Growth isn't concentration, but is amazing for keeping enemies locked down. Uh, quartering enemy movement speed is absurdly powerful and something that you will often want to be doing. Also, if you don't want a wild shape, you can just cast Call Lightning and stay zapping because every enemy will be wet. At Druid level 6, we get Magical Attacks, and we get access to Owlbear Form, which is a lot of extra damage for us. Um, Owlbear Form is, is the best one for... Just gen generally doing damage. Though at this level, your wild shape forms have started to fall off because we haven't taken Tavern Brawler yet. I think it's more important to get 
uh, higher wisdom, but you could take Tavern Brawler at level 4 if you find that you're spending a lot of time in your wild shape forms. Tavern Brawler, obviously, is going to be our next feat to maximize our wild shape damage. At Druid level 4, we get some of the best spells in the entire game. We get uh, access to Conjure Woodland Being and Conjure Minor Elemental, both of which play into our theme extremely well. One, we have Heroes Feast and we have Aid from the Cleric, so we can boost these summons quite well. Also, Conjure Woodland Being gives us an extra cast of Entangle and an extra cast of Spike Growth, which can lock enemies down in our ice surfaces and our electric surfaces, all of which are very powerful. Conjure Minor Elemental can be used to conjure the Ice Mephites, which will uh, let us throw more ice surfaces and do more cold damage, including doubled cold damage against various enemies. We also get Ice Storm for a significant amount of burst damage, or Confusion if we want something else to concentrate on. Freedom of Movement or Wall of Fire are other options. Freedom of Movement as a panic button if an ally gets stunned, a Wall of Fire will solve certain encounters on its own. This character, more than any other character, is going to be swapping in and out what spells you have prepared based on the encounter a lot, so get used to looking at the encounters and what spells you think are going to be good for them and changing your spell selection accordingly. Because Baldur's Gate lets you do that any time outside of combat, you should be doing it often. At this next level, we get access to Sabertooth Tiger Form, which is really good. I, I really like Sabertooth Tiger Form, but often we're going to want to be in Owlbear Form just because it has the highest strength, and we're going to take Tavern Brawler. Now, one downside of Tavern Brawler is there isn't really a good place for this odd-numbered stat point. Um, we are probably just going to drop our con to 15 and put those extra two points into intelligence or charisma or something like that uh strength just to have extra carry weight um because there isn't really a great place for this odd numbered stat point with our stat spread uh but tavern brawler is just so powerful for a moon druid anyways at time of recording tavern brawler is still bugged on honor mode it gives you the bonus attack rolls and not the bonus strength to damage. Um, they fixed it in patch 6 and then broke it again in a recent hot fix, so I don't know what the what the plan is for the eventual state of this feat, but currently it gives you the attack rolls but not the damage. But the attack rolls is the good part of this feat anyways, and hitting very reliably with your owlbear attacks is incredibly strong. Owlbears have 20 strength and can rage up to 22 for a plus 6 to hit with Tavern Brawler, which is an incredibly powerful effect, so I'd still recommend taking it on Moon Druids, especially when you've reached this level and are going to be using the more powerful wild shape forms that you want to be attacking with often. At level 9, you get access to Conjure Elemental, which gives you the Water Elemental or the Air Elemental, and then those will upgrade to the Myrmidon when you hit level 11, and that will get let you have Elementals and Myrmidons working together uh, to apply and create ice surfaces. The Water Myrmidon can wet entire groups of enemies all at once. Again, be cool. And uh, the Air Myrmidons do lightning damage. The air, air Elementals and Myrmidons do lightning damage. Again, all of which feeds very well into the theme of this party. Druid level 10, we get access to the Myrmidon forms. Um, and the Air Myrmidon is incredible. Doubled lightning damage is awesome. The Raging Vortex ability is actually really good for us as well. Uh, because it is going to silence enemies. And that is very powerful. Um locking enemies in place. The Earth Myrmidon is really good too, because the Earth Myrmidon doesn't have a weapon, so Tavern Brawler only works on non-weapon attacks, but the Earth Myrmidon doesn't have a weapon, so Tavern Brawler works on its attacks, and its attacks are so hit really, really hard. Uh, each attack does um, th 4d8 of damage, I think, and you get 3 attacks per uh per action since you're a 10th level druid, so you're doing massive damage hitting extremely reliably in Earth Myrmidon form, and Water Myrmidon is one of the best ways to get uh, enemies wet, and also does Heimel Strike, which is a cold damage based attack, and Explosive Icicle, which can set up a ton of ice surfaces. All of these Myrmidon forms and all of the elemental summons are all very good. I recommend getting used to all of them and experimenting with which one you like against certain enemies. We also get to pick up another cantrip. You can take Thorn Whip at this point. You can use it to pull enemies into hazardous surfaces. It's kind of fun. 
and then at Druid level 11, we get our 6-level spells. Usually your 6-level spell on this character is just going to be a Myrmidon Summon, um, just a Conjure Elemental upcasted to level 6. But also, uh, Wall of Thorns is incredibly good. There are some encounters where Sunbeam is good, and remember you can get haste from your wizard ally and double cast Sunbeam, and when you are using Sunbeam twice in a turn, 12 D8 of Radiant Damage that blind with two chances at blinding is awesome. So Hasted Sunbeam is really, really good. Also, this character actually benefits from Haste with Moonbeam or uh, Call Lightning as well. So there's some small synergies in there as well. In fact, this character and the Tempest Cleric, both concentrating on Call Lightning, can use that with Haste for incredible amounts of damage, or both concentrating on, on repeatable damage spells. Uh, uh, and is actually counterintuitively the better, these are the better haste targets than your martial character because they are going to be able to use these repeatable spells with the extra haste action at full effectiveness, despite the honor mode nerfs to haste. And Wall of Thorns is just an awesome spell that will win encounters on its own half the time. It's basically four of the best druid spells all in a single spell, and so... Um, when you don't have a Myrmidon Summon, or if you have an extra level 6 spell slot, or there's a particular spell with lot, uh, encounter with lots of small enemies, this is a great spell as well. Hero's Feast you're usually going to get from your Cleric, or of course a Camp Follower. And then finally, at Druid level 12, we're going to max out our Wisdom. You could also, if you are finding that you are not casting spells with save DCs, just take Alert. Again, Alert is incredibly strong. Uh, every party should have access to this on as many characters as possible. I think that this character will cast enough spells with save DCs that it's worth maxing your Wisdom, but it can also just be worth uh, picking up Alert if you're spending most of your time just hitting things in your wild shape forms. That'll depend a little on how your play has come together over the course of the run. For items for this character, again, this character does not need specific items very much. You are just looking for anything that uh, you're looking for a good medium armor and shield, and anything that lets you enter wild shape faster, so initiative boosts, again, are pretty good on this character. Obviously, those are going to be good on every character, so there's always going to be some tension in an honor mode party, because initiative is just so powerful. You get the best medium armor available. This character wants medium armor. Your, cler your Tempest Cleric wants heavy armor. Your uh, Lightning build wants... Uh, heavy armor or no armor, and your Berserker wants light armor, so there's very little tension in terms of the armor set, and uh, while all characters, all of these characters do get access to shields, there's enough good shields in the game to go around, so it's not like you're, there's going to be a huge problem in terms of having shield access. Um, you don't really care about your equipped weapon or anything like that, although it's nice to have a bow as a backup um, in the early game. Um, other than that, you are just looking for Anything that works while wild shaped, and anything that increases the save DCs of your spells, because both of those are very powerful. Uh, but mostly just any item that works while wild shaped, because you're going to spend most of your time in wild shape. Uh, other than that, no specific items required for this character, and so you get to get away with yet another character that doesn't need any items in particular. For this whole party, when you put it all together, what we're going to be doing in most combats is you are going to be initiating by blowing up the toughest enemy with, or you're going to be initiating by whacking the toughest enemy with a bottle of thrown water from your berserker and then blowing them up with a lightning bolt from your lightning lord. Then you're going to be locking down enemy, any remaining enemies with your tempest cleric and your druid's crowd control effects. And if they happen to survive through that turn and you need to spend more resources, you clean them up uh, at your leisure, either with just throws from your Berserker, or with Wild Shape attacks from your Druid. Um, your Tempest Cleric can then get in there with Spirit Guardians if a fight looks like it's going to go long. Um, and if an enemy is resistant to Lightning, or you are out of spell slots on your Lightning Lord, then you can always Twin Haste and use either uh, multicasted Sunbeams, which you can multi cast twice in a round if you're concentrating on it with haste, or just weapon attacks from your Berserker and your Druid to win smaller encounters. Between all of those things, you have incredible burst damage, incredible sustained damage, 
and excellent control, and I think that this build uh, uses one of the most powerful effects in the game extremely well. You're very good at applying it and very good at abusing it. You also get a lot of summons from your druid who can follow the party around and apply a bunch of extra effects, great support from the cleric, and great uh, control and sustained damage from every, uh, great control from every party member getting access to some of the most broken effects in the game. All right, my friends, I hope that you've enjoyed this look at this lightning damage or cold damage or wet focused party. And if this is something that you enjoy, definitely do uh, hit like and leave a comment. I really do appreciate people taking the time to do that because it helps me out a ton. Um, and I will be back next time with more party builds. Let me give me some ideas. You know, let me know what uh, other themed parties you'd like to see covered. I have some in mind, but definitely always open to suggestions. All right, my friends, thanks for watching. And of course, I will catch you next time.